Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 499. This will be our offertory hymn, 499. this morning brother Larry I uh, went over and I said uh, run your name by me one more time he said just call me brother Larry <laughs> I said that sounds good <laughs> but you come forward you take over and just take charge of the service let the Lord lead you good morning and happy Mother's Day to all you dear mothers out there. And my dear wife that's back there. Oh, there you are. You moved up. <laughs> She's my timekeeper. So if, if I go over, it's her fault. She, like, gives me the signal when the time comes. But anyway, I just uh, I do send greetings from uh, Funston Baptist Church. And... Um, and uh, it's, it's been a blessing to be able to come and speak with you folks. And uh, also, I was really encouraged to see my old friend, Bobby Hampton. And so pray your blessing on you, Bobby, and ponder. So, well, why don't we turn in our Bibles to John chapter 14. What I'd like to look at today is one of the most wonderful, blessed things that happens in the life of every true believer is that we get to know Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh, and he came to save us from our sins and from the wrath of God. When you hear that, are you saved? Do we think of what we are saved from. And a lot of people 
you know, a lot of people think of the fact that we're saved from our sin, we're saved from the troubles and the trials of this life, but ultimately we are saved from God's wrath upon sin because we're all sinners and we are all deserving of God's judgment for our sin, but in his mercy, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins. So I'd like to start with uh, John chapter 14 and um, verse 15. John 14, 15. If you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commandments. And here he's, he's talking about the fact of being obedient to the Lord, and that obedience comes when we love Jesus Christ. We don't obey Jesus in order to have him love us. We love him because he first loved us, and we obey him, and we have a desire to obey him because we love him. And he goes on to say, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, just like himself. Jesus, this is coming in the upper room discourse, and Jesus is telling them that he's going to be departing, and he's going to be returning to the Father when he accomplishes salvation for his people. And they're fearful, and they're worried. Why do you have to go away? And he says, it's good that I go away, because if I go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will come to you. And he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. You see, the world the unbelieving world cannot receive the Spirit of God. It's alien to him. But the children of God, they receive the Spirit of God. Because he neither, the world neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he dwells with you and will be with you and will be in you. And here he's speaking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He says he's with you. As Jesus was with them, his spirit was with them. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to be in them. And see, the wording there is very clear. It says, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you at Pentecost. And I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Think about that one statement right there. It is mind-boggling to think about. Almighty God, the creator of the universe, the all-knowing God, the sovereign one who rules over all of his creation. And nothing happens apart from his purpose and plan in this world. Nothing. We, we hear in the Sermon on the Mount that not a sparrow falls to the ground apart from his will. And he comes to live within every one of his children. That, to me, is a mind-blowing statement and truth that every Christian holds on to tightly because that's what gets us through every situation that comes into our life. Jesus promised it to his people. He says, in this world, you will most definitely, you will have trials and tribulations. But then he says, be of good cheer, 
For I have overcome the world. And I have come to live within you. And you in me. This statement is so powerful that um, it, often the pressures and the trials and the situations of, the, of this life, which we all have, no one without exception has trials in their life, even down to the youngest children. You know, when things aren't going right and you're upset about it. This is happening to every one of us. We have trials. But God is with us. He has promised never to leave us or forsake us. And it is important. It's, it's, it's impossible for us, when we think about this, it's impossible for us to come to him. We don't have the ability to come to God and receive him. He has to come to us. We have lots of examples of that throughout Scripture, but every time recorded in Scripture, when someone is saved, it's God that comes and awakens them to their need of him. And that's one of the points that, I, the main point that I wanted to look at this morning. Listen to how God does it all to make himself known to his people. God does it. He makes himself known to be in him and he in us. It's all God. And I look, we're going to look at Ephesians. Besides the book of Romans, which I think is one of the greatest treatments of, of the Christian faith, it's like a systematic theology of Christianity, the book of Romans. But next to that, I believe Ephesians is one of God's greatest gifts to us. The whole Bible is. It's all inspired. It's all perfect. His will, his word. But this book of Ephesians has the Apostle Paul showing us from start to finish. In fact, the first three chapters of the letter is is the doctrine of just who we are in Christ. What, how did we get there? How did we go from not knowing him, wandering, doing our own thing, to being in him, being a child of his? And that's what Paul explains in the book of Ephesians. And he starts in, just in the beginning. I, I just want to read um, this burst of praise, it's been called, by the Apostle Paul. The very first chapter, verse 1, is Paul's burst of praise. And note as I read the blessing of every Christian to be in Christ. We are in him. And how it is God's Holy Spirit that gives us this knowledge to know him. You see, we don't have the ability to know him. But God gives us that ability. He's the one that enables us to know him. And that goes from the youngest child all the way up to the oldest person. God comes and he reveals himself to us. That's how we know him. Listen to this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Mind-boggling. I can't explain that to you right now, or I'll go past over my time. It's but he has known us, his people, before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will and to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, in him, 
We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mysteries of his will, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on the earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That's what I was saying before. He's sovereign. He's in control of all things. And just as it says it there, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it. That means until we get to heaven to the praise of his glory. He has put us in him, and he has come to dwell in us, almighty God. It's the greatest privilege of any human being on the face of the earth is to have God dwelling in us. And that's what makes all the difference between one human being and another human being. We may look the same. We may even at times act the same as the world. But we have a blessed hope and promise that God himself in the person of Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, by the work of his Holy Spirit, he has taken possession of us as his inheritance, his sons and daughters. We are in Christ, and that is the greatest blessing of all. Paul goes on now. How do undeserved sinners like us receive such a blessed relationship that I'm explaining to you right now. We're all sinners, and we all have to admit that, that we are not like God. God is perfect. He is holy. And you know that word holy, it has a lot of different meanings, but the one main meaning throughout Scripture when it talks about holy, God, it talks about separate. He is separate. He's not like us. He is altogether different than we are. He is holy. He is set apart. And we are not. And he has called us out of this muck, muck and mire of sin, and he has brought us into his possession, in his family. And that's mind-boggling to think about. How would a perfectly holy God take sinners like us and bring us into his presence? Well, doesn't that defile God's holiness to bring sin into his presence? It would if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came. He came to take our place. He came to be the substitute for each one of his children, those who call upon the name of the Lord, those who look to Jesus Christ as their only Savior and the Lord of glory, they are made children of God and they are covered by the sacrifice of Christ. And the thing that we need to see is how Paul explains this. Now, this is something that I didn't realize it when I first got saved what really happened to me. And I think a lot of us don't think about this. But when we went from lost, separated, not knowing our God, to 
coming into his family. Something dramatic happened to us. And that comes, it's picked up on chapter 2, verse 1. Listen to what Paul says. This is what we were before we got saved. And you, Christian, he's speaking to the Ephesian church, he's speaking to the believers there. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You weren't just sick. You didn't just make mistakes now and then. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. All of us were born in that condition. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. We were following the way that everybody else is going. You know, it's that broad path that leads to destruction. We were all on that course, that course of this world. And we were following, listen to this, we were following the prince of the power of the air. That's a small p, the prince of the power of the air. The spirit, small s, that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Who is that? The devil. And among whom we all, not some of us, but we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. That means before we came to faith in Christ, we were just living for ourselves. We were living to please ourselves. We wanted to find pleasure and satisfaction and fulfillment in this world. And the whole reason we're here is what we figure we, we need to be happy. We need to be satisfied. We need to be um, um, fulfilled. We need to be reaching our desires, the things that we love. And that's what he goes on to say. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, just doing the things that Make us go. And this is what we were all doing. And we were by nature, here's that word that we don't like to talk about. We were by nature children of wrath. Children of wrath. Just like the rest of mankind. This indictment that Paul is stating here is that the whole human race is under the wrath of God because of our separation from God. We don't know God, and we're trying to just fulfill ourselves in life, and we take all different paths to fulfill ourselves in this life, whatever it might be. Some people stay in a very upright place. They're brought up in a good environment. Their parents love them and take care of them, but everything in their heart is their seeking fulfillment and joy and peace and that goes for everybody everyone is seeking Augustine one of the great um, um, theologians of the second century he said that we are all created with this empty space in our heart that we're trying to fill with the things of this world and we will never be satisfied with the things of this world that empty space we were created for is God in the person of Jesus Christ who comes into our hearts. And like we were just reading, he becomes our Lord and our Savior because he personally comes into our hearts and he dwells with us. And that is how we know God. That is how we have a relationship with God, is he comes to be with us. So listen to this, this long list of the way we were before we came to Christ. We were by nature children of wrath just like the rest. And then verse 4 is the most blessed statement. But God. But God, who is rich in mercy 
because of the great love with which he loved us? Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. So what did God do? God, in spite of the fact that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, going our own way, doing our own thing, had no understanding, no knowledge of God, God comes to us in mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is getting something that we don't deserve. We're, we're undeserved sinners, and we don't deserve to have the perfectly holy God come to us. And we can look throughout the Bible, and we see that that's what God always does to his people. He comes to them. They don't come to him. Because in our nature, we're running away from God. We're hiding from God. Think of the first sin, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned, and they were ashamed, and they realized that they went against God. And what did they do? God came to walk with them in the cool of the day in the garden. But they hid themselves from God. But God didn't leave it there. God pursued them. That's mercy. Because God made a command to them. He said, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And God, in justice, in his righteous Judgment, it's righteous judgment. He could have just wiped them out right then. But he had mercy. God came to them in mercy. And they confessed. And you know, God was the one that killed the first animal. There had been no death in the world before. But God came and he killed an animal and he covered them with the skins of that animal. And do you know that that is one of the beautiful pictures? Right there in the beginning of history, God makes a picture of how he's going to cover the sins of his people in his son, Jesus Christ. He was the sacrifice. He shed his blood, and he covers us with his righteousness. I'm getting a sign, so I, I got to... I got like a bunch more to go, but I'm going to just sit, wind it up right here. This is the key of what happened to us. God in his mercy, we all know this passage where it says, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he's raised us up with him and he's seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the age to come, he might show his immeasurable riches and his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that faith, that's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. You see that putting our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is a gift from God. That's what I was saying. God comes to us first. He opens our hearts to see our need of the Savior, and we cry out to him. Oh, Lord, save me. We, are, we become aware of our need of the Savior, and we cry out to him. And like I was just saying before, and Christ gave it all for us. There was no way for sinners who are under the wrath of God to come into the presence of a holy God without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. He was the atonement. He was the one that paid the penalty, the redeemer. He paid the penalty for our sins. And that's something that we should never forget. And if you're a Christian here this morning, which I believe many of you are, then you have been clinging to that very truth because God planted it in your heart many years ago, maybe. Maybe you've been a Christian for decades, like myself. 45 years ago, I surrendered my life to Christ. But he's with me, and he's promised always to be with me, and he reminds me over and over. What, what, what do we have that's a reminder of this over and over? The Lord's Supper, right? We celebrate the Lord's Supper because... 
We're forgetful people, but we need to be reminded always of what Christ did for us. And if you're here today and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, what I need to say is the truth of God's word. It's that you right now are disobedient. You are outside of his will. You are children of wrath. And God's judgment is still upon you. And you need to see your desperate situation. That only Christ can save you. And only God can open your heart to receive him. So what we need to do is what? Cry out and say, oh God, give me a heart of belief. Give me a heart of need that I see my sinfulness, I see my separation from you, and I need you. And cry out to him. And you want to know what the promise of Scripture is? Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, like that, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, knowing that you're a lost sinner, knowing that you can only be saved by Jesus Christ, you have to call out to him, and he'll save you. He'll save you today. It doesn't matter where you are in your life. It doesn't matter if, how deep in sin you might be right now. You could be lost. You could be a heroin addict. You could be a sexual pervert. It doesn't matter. You're out of God's will. And if you confess to him that you're lost and you need a savior, Jesus is the only savior, and you cry out to him, he will save you. That's what's in this passage. It says, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive. He comes to us when we're still in our sin, and he awakens us to our need of him, and we cry out, oh, Lord, save me. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I was going to look at some other passages, but I'm going to close right there because we can't know this gospel without it being revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. So that's the Holy Spirit's job. He convicts the world of, of, uh, um, of judgment. He convicts us of our sin, and he brings us to faith in Jesus Christ. So that's my plea to all of you, is that as believers, you cling and you look to that hope, and you look to Jesus in every area of your life, because he's your strength, he's your life. He lives in you. And if you're still not saved, you look to him because he's the only one that can deliver you from God's wrath and you can be saved. And we just give him all the glory for that. Let's pray together. Our great and mighty God and Father, how we thank you and praise you, Lord, for your wonderful mercy. A mercy, Lord, that is beyond our understanding. It's rich mercy because of this great love with which you loved us. And even when we were dead in our sins, you came and made us alive together with Christ. Thank you, Lord. It's all your grace. It's amazing grace. How sweet the sound of that to save a wretch like me. We praise you for that, Father. And Lord, I pray for each one of the people here today that, Lord, you would bless them with this great blessing like Paul gives in the first chapter of Ephesians. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So bless your people today. And Lord, I pray for those who are yet to be saved, that Lord, they would understand clearer than maybe they've ever before that they need you. And that Lord, you would come into their hearts and you would change their lives altogether. For we ask these things in Jesus' powerful name, amen.